Tiny mini microsystems like this are extremely popular on the used market, especially in the home lab space. This makes a lot of sense. They have solid performance, a small footprint, and you can often grab them for under $50. Well, at least certain models like this Gen 3 HP Elite desk. But if you start looking at something just a few generations newer, you're probably going to pay at least double. Is the performance or efficiency twice as good? Well, spoiler, no. But these somewhat newer HP Elite and Pro desks have a lot of interesting and useful features, and this might just make them worth the extra money, especially if you like to get a bit hacky. Oh, and if you're lucky, you might be able to find a really good deal on whatever this is. Whether you're using one of these little PCs as a desktop, a home server, or something else entirely, chances are you'll eventually run into a situation where having a solid VPN service comes in handy. Fortunately, today's sponsor, Private Internet Access, has you covered. Now, odds are, if you're watching this, I don't need to explain to you what a VPN is. You might already be self-hosting your own. I run a few VPN servers myself, but I've also been using PIA now for over a year, and it's been great. I've had no issues, I get fast speeds, and I love having access to tons of servers all over the world. It's perfect for those occasional yet critical times where I need to access geo-restricted content or websites. I also really like that I can use it on as many devices as I want, from my laptop to my phone, or peck even my router. And if you've decided that this is finally the year of the Linux desktop, well, good news, it works on Linux too. It can also be helpful for your home lab. I've been running PIA with a Docker container called Gluten to easily route other containers through their servers with no issues. There's also a ton of other helpful features like port forwarding, split tunneling, and more. And they follow a strict no logs policy that's been audited by third parties. So if you're looking for a fast and reliable VPN service, make sure to check out PIA by using my link down in the description below. With that, you get 83% off plus four months for free. If you've watched my channel for any amount of time, you've probably seen one or two of these tiny mini microsystems. Also, I guess I've never really explained the tiny mini micro name, but that term comes from the names of OEM office systems that come in, well, this form factor. For Lenovo, it's tiny, for HP, it's mini, and for Dell, it's micro. If you scroll on r slash home lab for more than like five seconds, you'll come across these being put to use, and for good reason. As the name suggests, they're small, and they're typically very efficient. And since they were designed for businesses and enterprises, they often come with some helpful features, such as options for remote management. You can also find great deals on these on sites like eBay. For example, this HP Elite Desk G3 Mini with a 6th Gen i5 can probably be found right now for under $50. I've used this thing a ton on the channel because it still works great for tons of applications, but this is pretty much the most modern tiny mini microsystem I've ever used, so I decided it was time to try something else out. So I picked up this HP ProDesk 600 G6 Mini. Now, if you just go look at the buy it now prices, you might find listings for these well over $200. But if you're patient, you can probably win one in an auction like I did for around $150 plus $15 shipping. Unfortunately, I didn't realize it didn't come with an AC adapter, so I also had to buy one of those as well. The unit was in pretty good shape when I got it, aside from just some typical dust buildup. Fortunately, one of the other great things about these systems is that rather than having to remove a ton of screws or anything, you can simply loosen a single screw on the back to open up the case. This gets you access to just about everything, and then to get to the RAM, you can just lift up the fan. You can also loosen three screws to take off the CPU heatsink, and oh my goodness, that's a lot of thermal paste. One second. Okay, that's better. With the case opened up, it was really easy to dust everything out so that we could get a good look at what all this little ProDesk has to offer. The CPU in this unit is the Intel i5-10500T, a hyper-threaded 6-core from Intel's Comet Lake lineup. It has a base frequency of just 2.3 GHz, but can turbo up to 3.8 GHz. It features Intel's UHD Graphics 630 and can support up to 128GB of DDR4-2666 SOTA memory, although my system just came with 16GB. The inside includes two NVMe M.2 sockets that both support PCIe Gen 3x4. There's also an M.2 E key socket for the included Wi-Fi card that supports one lane of PCIe Gen 3. Now there are a few more useful features on the inside, but we'll come back to those here in just a minute. On the front, you get some pretty standard I.O. with two 10 gigabit per second USB ports, with one being Type-C and the other being Type-A, and then you get another Type-A 5 gigabit per second port. There's also a combo audio jack and the power button. On the back, you get two DisplayPort 1.4 outputs, a handful of 5 and 10 gigabit per second USB Type-A ports, a gigabit Ethernet jack, and the DC barrel plug for the 19 volt power supply. Now there's also this USB-C port here, but this actually comes from what's called the Flex I.O. port. Well, this is the first Flex I.O. port, which can be swapped out for a variety of modules, from HDMI adapters to Thunderbolt to even network interfaces. There's also this blank panel here for the Flex port 2, which is just for USB 2 or serial. 
However, on some of the Elite Desk models, not the Pro Desk models, this is actually where a dedicated GPU could go. Now, we'll definitely be coming back to these flex ports here in a moment, but first, what's that mystery system I mentioned in the intro? Well, this is actually an HP Engage Flex Mini, which is part of HP's Engage lineup. These systems are primarily designed for point of sale use in retail and hospitality sectors, which means this little Flex Mini is completely different from the Pro Desk. Sure, they share the same form factor, they have the same I.O., they look nearly identical, but okay, yeah, from what I can tell, this Engage Flex Mini is basically the exact same thing as the Pro Desk, aside from just a few small details. First, there isn't a product name on the front of the case. Also, the Engage system doesn't include a Wi-Fi adapter. And the motherboard is a slightly different revision, although really the only difference I could find is that the VRMs were soldered into slightly different places, but the number of the VRMs was the same on both. Oh yeah, and the CMOS battery looks a little bit different, but that's because somebody didn't know how to get the battery out properly and broke it. So I had to super glue on a little 3D printed part to fix it. So yeah, these two systems are pretty much the same, except the Engage came with eight gigabytes of RAM and an i3 10100T. This CPU is similar to the 10500T, but only has four cores and eight threads, a higher base frequency, and half the cache. Now, I would love to say that these lesser known point of sale systems can be bought for quite a bit cheaper, but that doesn't necessarily seem to be the case. In fact, it seems to commonly be the opposite. That being said, I did buy my Engage Flex Mini for just $160 plus free shipping. Now that's not that much cheaper than the Pro Desk, which also has better specs, but I did win the Pro Desk in an auction, whereas with this system, I just bought it using a buy it now listing. There aren't a ton of these point of sale systems on the market, but it's still possible that you might be able to come across one and find a good deal in the future and pretty much get a Pro Desk. It's no silver bullet for getting a good price, but it is one more option to be aware of when you're out there searching for good deals. Now there's also the option of getting an Elite Desk, which I've mentioned a few times now. From what I can tell, as long as you don't go for one of the GPU equipped models, these are very similar to the Pro Desk in terms of core features, but they might come equipped with higher end CPUs and therefore more power phases, and I think even a mesh lid to help with thermals. There also might be a few more helpful enterprise features that only work with the Elite Desks, but sadly I can't say for sure. I did buy one, but it's taking a long time to ship, so at least at the time of filming this, I was only able to test these two systems here. If the Elite Desk does get here before I finish editing, I'll make sure to note anything important. As I hinted at in the intro, the performance on these isn't mind-blowing or anything, so I'll just go through a few benchmarks really quick. I tested both HP G6 systems, and also grabbed some results from other systems for comparison. First, that Elite Desk 800 G3 Mini with an i5-6500T, and then also this Camry Mini PC with an Intel N100. In Cinebench R23, the Pro Desk with its 12-core i5 was clearly the best when it comes to the multi-threaded benchmark, but when it comes to single-threaded performance, the improvement from the older HP Elite Desk isn't insane. This pattern is pretty similar here with Geekbench 6 as well. Also, sorry that I don't have the N100 numbers for this one. Moving on to System Power Draw, when just sitting idle in Windows, the newer HP systems performed the best. Granted, all four systems were within just a few watts of each other. I also tested idle power draw in Proxmox after running PowerTop Autotune and the Auto ASPM script, and with no display connected. Here, the older Elite Desk actually performed just a hair better. When running the multi-threaded Cinebench render, most of the systems had a fairly consistent total power draw, but while the Pro Desk eventually sat at around 51 watts, it initially jumped up to 72 watts while the CPU boosted to a higher clock frequency. When looking at just the sustained power draw, the Engage and ProDesk systems drew quite a bit more power than the other two, however, they both performed better as well. If you divide the Cinebench score by the total wattage, you can sort of get a points per watt metric, where the higher the number, the more efficient the system is. And here, while well, the N100 system takes the lead, but we can also see that the older Elite Desk falls quite a bit behind in terms of efficiency. Now, I was a bit curious why the 10100T didn't have a similar turbo boost behavior to the 10500T, and I wasn't quite sure if that was due to the CPU or the system it was in. To try and figure it out, I dropped the 10500T into the Engage Flex Mini and reran Cinebench. Now, it turns out that it was mostly just the behavior of the CPU, as the clock speeds of the 10500T jumped up as you would expect here, but interestingly, the clock speeds didn't boost quite as high, and therefore the system didn't draw as much power and performed a bit worse. I double checked that there weren't any settings to tweak some sort of power profile in the BIOS, so I guess one actual difference between the Engage system and the Pro Desk is that the Engage seems to run with a slightly lower power profile or something along those lines. Now that's really it for all of my benchmarks and such. If you're really curious to learn more, I highly recommend checking out the Serve the Home website. They have a ton of in-depth reviews and benchmarks, so you can really see how a variety of these tiny mini microsystems perform. I think for the most part, these systems can all handle typical home server or desktop workloads just fine. So to me, what really sets these newer systems apart is the I.O. 
The Elite Desk G3 Mini and many other systems from this generation typically have one NVMe socket, a SATA port for a 2.5 inch hard drive, and then an M.2 E key slot for Wi Fi. With the newer G6 systems, you get two NVMe sockets as well as the Flex IO port. Now, the older HP Minis also had a Flex port, but that generation didn't have a ton of great options for it. When it comes to tinkering or self hosting, really the best use for it was just to remove it entirely. Then you could use that space for a cool 3D printer bracket like this one for an M.2 to Ethernet adapter. The G6 models, however, use the Flex IO V2 cards, which offer a lot more options. Now, most systems come with something boring like HDMI or DisplayPort, but there are much better options. First, there's this USB C power delivery adapter that came with my ProDesk. This not only adds another USB C port, but can actually be used to power the system using USB power delivery, which is pretty neat. The best options, in my opinion, though, are either the 2.5 gig or 10 gig network cards. The 10 gig adapter is pretty tough to find, and it's also pretty expensive. Granted, not really that expensive when compared to other M.2 adapters. But the 2.5 gig adapter can be found much easier for around $30 on eBay. It's really easy to swap these cards out. You just remove a few screws, pop out the old card, and then pop the new one into place. After booting into Proxmox, I had a second network interface. Oh, and I should also mention that this card uses the Intel i225V controller rather than a Realtek controller, so you should have a much better time if you plan to build a PFSense or OpenSense router. There's also that second flex adapter, which as I mentioned is really only for serial or USB 2 adapters, but it's also a handy removable panel. Perfect for mounting something like another 2.5 gig bitnik. Since I still had that E-key socket available, I picked up this E-key to Intel i226V 2.5 gigabit adapter. I found this great model online from John Douglas, but it wouldn't quite fit my adapter, so I used it as a starting point to make my own, and ended up with this. It printed out in just a few minutes and was super easy to screw in place. Because of how tall the adapter was, there was a bit of a clearance issue, so I had to trim away this little clip from the inside of the lid. And then I also used some captain tape just to make sure and avoid any shorts. It probably would have been just fine without it, but I've been a lot more cautious ever since, well, ever since the incident. That a spark flies off to the side. That a spark flies off to the side. If you're not sure what I'm talking about because you don't watch every single one of my videos, I was working on a project for this little uh, custom NAS box thing up here where I used an Intel NUC board, but I accidentally shorted it out with a loose wire and I had to buy a whole replacement and it really sucked. So yeah. Anyway, with the system booted back up, sure enough, I now had dual two and a half gigabit NICs and it looks so cool. Now, if you only needed the one two and a half gigabit port and you didn't need Wi-Fi, you could also use this E-key port for something else. I wouldn't recommend what I did here though. Uh, I was hoping to see if I could get this old eSATA enclosure working by using this M.2 to SATA adapter and then a SATA to eSATA adapter and then and plug that into the enclosure. And I actually dropped in four hard drives and to my surprise, they all showed up. However, when I actually tried to do anything, well, it got really buggy and Proxmox crashed and yeah, it wasn't a good time. I probably just don't have a good grasp on how this enclosure works or really even how the SATA protocol works. Also, this corrosion probably wasn't doing me any favors. So how about moving on to a more reasonable idea like using this E key to M key adapter for an NVMe SSD. This specific adapter is great here because it reverses the orientation of the SSD so that it can actually fit in the case. Using a 2280 length NVMe SSD was still going to be a bit too big though. So I just snapped off this bit here and used a 2230 SSD instead. Since the adapter was barely brushing up against one of the other SSDs, I used some more captain tape here for safety, but in the end, everything fit just fine. Now sure, this SSD would be limited to just one lane of PCIe Gen 3, but that's still kind of close to a gigabyte per second in terms of bandwidth and would probably work just fine for a boot SSD, leaving you with two NVMe sockets for mirrored storage, VMs, or whatever. Or you could take advantage of those extra PCIe lanes for other cool adapters. And if this still isn't enough storage for you, well, if you look closely, you can see that there's a tiny little connector labeled hard drive, and it actually looks nearly identical to the SATA connector on the older Elite Desk G3. Now, I just assumed that these G6 systems didn't have an option for a hard drive since they came with an extra NVMe slot. But as it turns out, you could originally configure these to also come with a two and a half inch hard drive. Obviously, neither of my systems included the cage or the adapter, but I did still have my two and a half inch adapter from the older Elite Desk. Now, I probably should have been safe and checked online beforehand, but I just sent it and hooked up the G3's adapter and, well, it actually worked. Unfortunately, if you didn't already have this adapter, it looks like the cable and drive cage assembly for the G6 models will cost you a fair bit on eBay, but you might be able to find a better deal if you just buy the SATA adapter for one of the earlier models. In that case, though, you would have to get a bit creative when it comes to mounting solutions, but hey, technically you could fit three NVMe SSDs and a two and a half inch hard drive all in this tiny little enclosure. 
Oh yeah, I also noticed this little second fan header that I think would have been used for a dedicated GPU if needed. And I'll spare you the details of how I came up with this janky solution here, but yeah, technically you can add a PWM fan if you wire it up right. Unfortunately though, there's no software control, so it's probably not all that useful, and realistically it's probably going to be easier to figure out using USB power or something. Something that actually is useful though is remote management. Since these systems were designed for professional work environments, they include Intel's AMT platform. This means you should be able to control some of the functions remotely, even if the system is powered down. After setting up a password and configuring the network settings in the BIOS, I was able to use some software called Mesh Commander to connect to and manage the ProDesk. With this, you can remotely power on and off the system, get access to serial over LAN, and more. But unfortunately, the ProDesk doesn't support KVM functionality. This is where you'd be able to have a video output and use a virtual mouse and keyboard. And I think this is actually one of those features that separates the Elite Desk from the ProDesk. Okay, so the Elite Desk actually came in while I was editing this video, and I can confirm that the KVM functionality does work. Now, like I said, this does support serial over LAN, but I've actually never been able to get that working. It's always just been a blank screen for me. But I decided today was the day I would try and figure it out. I pretty quickly learned that as long as you don't have a display connected to the system, it works in the BIOS menu just fine. But once you boot into the operating system, well, I once again just had nothing. After a bit of Googling and tinkering, I figured out that I could check dmessage and proxmox to see which serial device was active, and then I could make some changes to the grub config, and enable this service to finally get a console working properly. It's not perfect, it's a bit sluggish, but it's much cheaper than buying a KVM. So all in all, I think these HP G6 Minis are pretty awesome, and there's a lot you can do with them. However, well, they're still a bit expensive when compared to the older models. Now, if you wanna save some money and you don't care about aesthetics, you might be able to buy a beat up one like I did with my Elite Desk, but if you're looking for really good deals, you might be tempted by some BIOS locked systems. Now you might actually remember that this Elite Desk G3 was also a BIOS locked system, but I managed to pretty easily clear that by just simply shorting a jumper. The G6 systems sadly don't have that jumper, but I was curious if there might be a way to clear a BIOS lock without having to get into desoldering chips and modifying binaries and such. I ended up stumbling across an awesome blog post from Reese Goodwin where he outlined a process for resetting the password. Essentially, on one of the two flash chips, you just short pin 2 to ground and attempt to start the system. Then you just pretend that these scary red lights aren't there, and then power cycle the system again. And magically, for me, it just worked. Now I want to be clear, if you want to go out and buy a BIOS locked system and try this, do it at your own risk. Don't blame me if anything goes wrong, I just thought I'd share that bit of information I found in case it's helpful. I think these little machines are pretty awesome, especially if you're like me and you want to leverage all of the slots and flex IO and such. If so, I think they're probably worth the money. However, if you just want some simple little systems to run some services on or build a cluster with or just mess around with, it's really hard to beat some of the older inexpensive tiny mini model mi tiny mini model micros out there. It's really hard to beat some of the older inexpensive tiny mini micro models out there. Hopefully you enjoyed taking a look at these systems. I certainly did. If so, maybe give the video a like maybe consider subscribing, or even becoming a raid member for as little as a dollar a month. With that, you get early access to all of my videos without any ads, I think it's a good deal. That's about it for this one though, so as always, thank you guys so much for watching, stay curious, and I really can't wait to see you in the next one.